Have you ever gone to fill up a sink or possibly fill up a bathtub? And we probably wouldn't acknowledge this, but in, in going to fill it up, have you ever put in the stopper, turned on the water, got sidetracked with something else, and when you turned around or came back, it was overflowing? Now, we don't have to, we don't have to acknowledge that. The Christian life is sort of like that sink. If you just get enough to fill the sink, that is where you're maintaining your life. And many people have a, have a difficulty in maintaining their life. But what happens when a life is clogged from sin, and the Holy Spirit starts filling that life up, what is supposed to happen is an overflow into the lives of other people. And many times we're just struggling to get the sink of our life filled where God wants it to be overflowing. And as we turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, Paul has covered just several things. And one of the things that Paul is going to cover is continued spiritual growth. I think we would all admit that we haven't arrived yet. We haven't gotten there yet. And if you think that you have gotten there, that could be a telltale sign that you've not. Can somebody say amen? Okay, and that's pretty good with muffled masks. God bless you. Um, and so we know that we have to continue to grow spiritually. God never intended for your life or mine to be the same uh, and not growing and stagnant. Stag stagnancy was never the plan of God. And what Paul is talking to this place called Philippi and the Philippian people there, and he's talking to the believers that he has been able to reach and that the church has been growing and reaching, was a spiritual growth within these believers' lives. Paul told them in the book of Galatians, a little place called Galatia, and you know, I'm just going to read it for you. We're going to go to Philippians 1 in a moment. But in Galatians, there's just a, a, a very strong, strong verse because Paul's heartbeat were that people would continue to grow. And I think where some discontentment settled in in the Christian life is when we stop growing. We don't see that new growth within our lives. My little children, and Paul had such a heart as a father towards these people. That was his perspective. His sons in the faith, his children in the ministry. He says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again. Paul's like, I have given you the word and seen you grown in the word. I, I have, watch the illustration he's using. I have birthed you in the word and brought you to the word. And he says, I am travailing. I am laboring to the point of exhaustion that Christ would be formed within you. That you would continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we look within our hearts and lives and we ask ourselves, are we continuing to grow and mature in the Lord? And that's what Philippians is dealing with. The key thought of Philippians is to rejoice and hook towards uh, on to rejoicing is spiritual growth because through our spiritual growth we're able to handle all things and have an attitude of rejoicing. In Ephesians 1, Paul told them this. It's all through the Bible, not only in Philippians. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 16 through 18. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. As we go, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now watch what he says. Notice closely. Ready? May give unto you the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of revelation and the knowledge of Him, as we look that the eyes of your understanding would be, might be uh, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And where does this wisdom and this enlightenment and all this comes from? come from? It comes from the Word of God. I am a firm believer that the devil and our flesh will keep us away from the Word of God because there is no spiritual growth separated from the Word of God. And Paul is like, my, my, my desire for you is that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that the Word of God would quicken your mind, that you would be able to see things from a different perspective. Right now, we are viewing life through the voices of people's perspective. And whether it would be one news station, or another news station, or one radio station, or another radio station, or one friend, or another friend. Right now, we are getting life from so many perspectives. And Paul is like, the perspective that you should be able to look at life through is through the perspective of the Word of God. People have asked me this morning, preacher, are you wearing contacts? Nope. My glasses have officially given up the ghost. I will be going and getting a 
new pair this week. And so the good thing for y'all, you can do anything you want this morning, and I cannot see you. Uh, but this is a different perspective, right? And so we put glasses on to help our perspective, to be able to see things more clearly. And you're like, preacher, things are so foggy and muddled right now. I want to be able to see things more clearly. The way to do that is put on the goggles of God's holy word. And that's what Paul is saying. He said later in Ephesians to the same church there in Ephesus, and he says in verse 11 of chapter 4, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave gifts to the church, ministers to the church for, for if you underline or circle stuff, for the perfecting of the saints. That the saints of God would be matured. And he says for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Because we are supposed to grow in the Lord. And as we're maturing and growing in the Lord, service is not something that the pastor does to browbeat people or to manipulate people or to guilt people. It's an overflow of our life as we are maturing and growing in the Lord, we're working in the ministry, and we work in the ministry for the edifying or the encouragement of the body of Christ. So Paul is all about spiritual maturity through all these letters, they're called epistles, all these letters that Paul sent to these different locations, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, to all these places he's dealing with that they would grow in the Lord. In the book of Philippians, Paul says, I have you in my mind, and then he says, I have you in my heart. And then he says, I have you in my prayers. And I have found that if you really want to love people to get them in your mind and in your heart, they must be in your prayers. And as you pray for people, it's amazing what God will do in your heart and in mine. So Philippians 1, let's look at verses 9 through 11 this morning. Paul says, and this I pray. If you notice through all these letters, Paul is praying for them and praying for them and this I pray that your love. Would you, would you underline that in your Bibles if you, if you mark in your Bible that your love. Your love. And so he's going to get very personal. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound. That is that overflowing of the sink or the tub. It's an overflow of the life. That your love may abound yet more and more. And uh, buddy, when you fill up the sink and the water is still just a torrent coming into that sink or that glass or whatever vessel it may be, when it reaches that, ca that, that capacity point and the water is coming in, it's just, it gushes and it gushes and it gushes. And that's what Paul is saying. You're filling your life up with Christ. You're maturing in Christ. And one of those signs of your maturity in Christ is that your love is flowing over and abounding and overflowing. It's beautiful right there, the wording, that your love may abound yet more and more and that thought there is yet more and more and more and more and more and more there's no limiting the amount of love that our lives can pour out to other people yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment look at verse 10 with me that you may approve then we're going to discuss all these things in a moment that you may approve things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ verse 11 being filled now watch this the, the whole overflowing mentality here being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of yourself. Oh, y'all are listening. I am so proud of y'all because it's not for us, is it? And sometimes we're like, well, if I'm not going to benefit from this love thing, if I'm not going to benefit from my actions, if I'm not going to get a pat on the back or, or, a, or a howdy duty or a hello or whatever it may be, then I'm really not going to love. I mean, you know, you, you hurt me, I'm not going to love you. And he says, understand this overflowing of your life, of Christ and your maturity of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Tony, it is not for yourself. It's unto the glory and praise of God. And so we are to let our light so shine before men, our love to be saved seen by other people that they would praise and glorify the God in heaven. So, if you're going to write down some things, just three simple things. Ready? Number one, the priority of love. The priority of love. When something is a priority, or if you've got uh, some of these computer programs, or a day timer, or whatever uh, business thing you may use for your structure uh, and your task list, there's a, a section there where you can prioritize your tasks. And uh, there, there may be a sheet of paper, and you're like, things I need to get done today. Well, the first thing I need to get done is, and you write it down. And the second thing I need to get done, and you write down the second thing. You prioritize, and the priority of love is the number one thing, that love would fill our life. And this, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. He says, I want you to grow in love. It's got to be a priority that you focus on, that you would grow in love. One man said this. 
He says, in fact, apart from genuine godly love, every other virtue and activity, no matter how seemingly biblical and sincere, amounts to nothing. Think of life and all of our actions and what we do absented from love. And you're like, well, wow, wow, preacher, can you help explain this? Well, let me let the Bible explain this. Ready? Remember 1 Corinthians 13? You remember the, the love chapter, the chapter on love? That This chapter, no matter what angle you go, it, you will never plumb the depths of this because it's dealing with love and God is love and God has no depth. I mean, he has no end to his depth. So now watch what he says. Paul says, though, and this is illustrative, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, though I have the oratory to astound the heavens, he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and, and have not charity, have not love, he says, I, I'm, I'm just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and maybe putting that a little bit lower on the level of our humanity. It doesn't matter what you say. It does matter what you do. Many people can run their mouth, but there's just no action to back it up. And he says, though I have the tongues of men and of angels. He says, without love, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though, notice the though, he's illustrating these things. And, and though I have the gift of prophecy. I mean, everybody wants to get in. You know, he's a prophet. And prophecy dealt with foretelling in the Old Testament. New Testament did the forth telling of, of us telling what God has already said. He says, do I have the gift of prophecy? And though I had the mind to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, he says, no, if I was the culmination of all these things, and I have, uh, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I, I'm nothing. Some people can be so godly and have the biggest of Bibles and quote the most scripture and seemingly dress right and smell right and act right. And brother, sisters, they are just right. Ask them and they'll tell you. they just right. But there's no love in their life. And I have the faith to remove mountains. But I have no love. See, the actions, no matter how noble they may be, when they are separated and absented of love, they lose their substance. He says, and though I bestow all my goods, I'm a benevolent person, I'm a giving person, I'm a gracious person, and though I bestow all my goods to, to feed the poor, and though I, though, and notice the word though through all these things, it's not that Paul has done those, it says, if, if I had done these things, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, he says, it profiteth me nothing. And so the priority of love within our life. If, if a pastor or a preacher or family member was to give a summation of your life or mine at our funeral service, would the priority of our life, would the one word that helps to describe your life, my life, would it be love? The priority of love. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. And the Lord make you, now he's talking to a, th a church in Thessalonica. Remember, these are real cities and real churches and real people. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in what, church? Increase and abound in one toward another. Well, the older I get, the more hateful I get. Well, is there something wrong there, amen? You're like, well, preacher, you let enough years go under the, uh, let, let enough years go under the bridge and you'll see people for what they are. Well, I'm not as old as some and not as, not as young as some and... You know, I just tell you, it doesn't matter our age or what you and I experience or how you and I are treated. The spiritual maturity within our life, God wants to see it overflow. That we would be more and more and more and more loving. And the things that challenge us, that hurt us, that grieve us, that offend us, those things are to help grow us in love. And after I preach that, I will have a wonderful week. Can somebody say amen? It, it always happens that way. And he says, the Lord make you. He, Paul's heart. He says, and the Lord make you to increase, and uh, notice the word again, abound, overflowing, in love one toward another. My soul, beloved, if there's a group of people that should have just a, a sweet, sweet love for one another, should it not be God's people? Should it not be God's house? Y'all can talk, amen or no, amen. It, it, it should be us. And the neat thing about it is whether they're believers or part of Newton or whether they're in Nigeria or another country in the world, it's a beautiful thing that with our hearts and lives, love should overflow. 
flow. Our love should be abounding. And that's what Paul says. And toward one another, toward one another. You have schisms in your family. You have schisms in your friendships. You have schisms with people. People are going to be people, but we don't let them dictate our love because that's the product of the Holy Spirit within our life. And he says, I want to make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. Well, some people are easy to love. Some people are easy to love. Well, I'll preach some people are hard to love. Some people maybe a little bit more of a challenge to love. But he says, I want your love to abound one toward another and also toward all men, even as we do towards you. Paul said, notice the example that we have set. We have shown you how to love. And so godly love is produced by the Holy Spirit. I have found, I have found and, and I, I would ask you, is it not a true statement, that the more I'm in the Bible... The more I'm sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the more I allow the Holy Spirit to have jurisdiction in my heart and life, the more I find myself able to love other people. Amen or no? I've also found that when I'm not in the Bible, and I don't allow the Holy Spirit to run my life, I find that I can be short, hateful, mean, arrogant, and all the things that would be the antithesis of a Spirit-filled life. Are y'all with me? Amen or no? And so notice this with me, Romans 5, 5. He says, hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the Holy Spirit runs our life, rules our life. There's a priority of love that of all the things that we would be known for, of all the things that Newton would be known for, and I'm not talking about our philosophy of ministry. I'm talking about the actions of our life. I am telling you, you cannot go through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation without seeing the deep vein of love. God showing love, God demonstrating love, and then God in our lives continuing love into the lives of other people. And people are like, well, this is, this is such a simple thought. Isn't it amazing? It's such a simple thought, but it's a challenge in our daily lives. Love. Galatians 5, and 23. You know these verses very well. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? The fruit of the Spirit is? There's a production of the, what the Holy Spirit does in our life. The Holy Spirit is in me. Paul said in Philippians later on, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling that there would be a, an awe that we're working out what God has worked in. And so as I allow the Holy Spirit to have jurisdiction within my heart to sit upon a throne of my life to control my attitude, to control my actions, to control my demeanor, to control everything about me, when I allow the Holy Spirit to control me, the thing that will naturally come, I don't have to work it up, I don't have to fake it, I don't have to manipulate it, there's going to be something as a Holy Spirit of God, as it work within my life, that's going to naturally abound, overflow within the vessel of my life, and that is love love and joy. And isn't it amazing if you look at love and we have a life full of love? Isn't it amazing? It doesn't matter what the circumstances dictate. Isn't it amazing that there's a joy in your life? Why is there such a joy in your life? Because there's such a peace within your heart and life that God is in control. And then long-suffering. And there's, there's just a patience and a meekness and a temperance and an ability to endure which you normally wouldn't be able to endure because of the peace of God that brings joy within our life that is funneled by love. So many of these things, if you took the fruit of the Spirit and just study on it and see how one is hinged upon the other. And so Paul's like, I want you to abound. I want you to overflow. I want love to be a real part of your life. And so the Bible teaches us, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, Paul says, but it's touching brotherly love. You need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, now notice this now, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye, now what does it say? That ye, what's that next word? That ye more and more. Now no, notice the wording. Abound more and more. All those words overflowing that the vessel of our life, controlled by the Holy Spirit, that something naturally would erupt from our lives, and that is the love of God. You know, First John says this, Beloved, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of whom? Love is of God, okay? And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. There's a direct correlation here. He that loveth not knoweth not God. People are like, well, I'm just incredibly spiritual. I'm going to give you something. Chew on it, okay? Chew on it. Somebody that says that they're super spiritual or, or very, um, 
you know, maybe boisterous about just how godly they are. And the next side of their mouth is full of gossip and hatred and mean words and mean things. Um, according to the Bible, they're not quite as godly as they think they are. Now, that's a powerful point. I'm not trying to be ugly, but it, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Look at verse 9 with me. And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. We didn't deserve God's love. We didn't do anything to merit God's love. The thing that staggers me is my, even my most righteous acts as a human being. Even my most righteous acts next to the holiness of God are leprous, filthy rags. And so all of a sudden, I want God to work within me uh, and give me the love that God had toward me. I didn't deserve God's love. How many would say, you didn't deserve God's love? Say amen. We didn't deserve God's love, but he gave it to us anyway, man. And you know, there may be somebody in your life right now, they don't deserve your love according to human standards. Would you give it to them anyway? Ah, it's not easy. You may be hurt, you may be pained, but would you give it to them anyway? Because this is one of the things that earmarks us, that sets us apart than everybody else is the love that's overflowing from our life. There are some people, it doesn't matter if you punch them, poke them, cut them, or shoot them. Love is going to come out of their life. Am I like that? Are you like that? Is it so, are we so full of God's love that if you punch us, whether with word or action, love is going to come out? We're like, bless God, you punch me, I'm going to show you what's going to come out. And that's the humanity of it, amen. I'm not saying go get pulverized by some punk. But there should be within our hearts and within our lives a distinctiveness of love. Jesus had a way of just taking this whole thing of love and dealing with Tony's mindset and struggles. In Matthew 5, 43, again, we're dealing with the priority of love. Jesus says, you've heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. And we're like, yeah, baby, you know, give us a little leeway, buddy, you know, <laughs> amen. And Jesus says, go back to 43, if you don't mind, beloved, you've heard that it hath been said. Not that it's written in the word of God, not that it's truth, this is man thought. Man's rationing is, love thy neighbor, hate your enemy. Notice God's thoughts. Verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Oh, boy, wait a minute. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. What, what in the world is Christ talking about? He says, I say, now man in 43, man said you can love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, God says the biblical thought, the godly thought, the person that is full of me, is going to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And so here we go again. We're going to take this overflowing, this abounding, abundant life that is going to be saturated in the Word of God, saturated in the Spirit of God, so that love comes out of our life. Preacher, I don't think I can do that. Neither can I. That's the reason we must be filled, controlled by God's Holy Spirit. Keep on going if you don't mind. Verse 45, he says this, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Verse 46, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? He's like, it's easy to be nice to those that are nice to you, but what about those that aren't so nice to you? What about those that are really quite rude to you? He says, for you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? Do not even the politicians, the, the, the carnal and saved man, do they not do the same? Our love is to be distinctly different than everybody else. Do you know this, beloved? Biblical love is a choice. It's a choice. Love is a decision. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not a warm fuzzy I've done so much marriage counseling, and I try not to be cynical and rude, but I've done so much marriage counseling that they want to say to me, I just don't feel like I love them. And I know I shouldn't, and I'm asking you to pray for me that I'd be more gracious, but I get just sometimes, Brother Doug, just a little, you know. And I'm like, you want to feel something? Yes, Pastor, I want to feel something. I like then lick your finger and stick it in the electrical outlet. Love is not about feelings. Love is a decision that you and I make. Did Jesus Christ love you and I? 
Was it not for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God? Love on that cross. For, Father, forgive them, for they know what not what to do. Love, biblical love, is a choice that you and I made. Jesus was in such agony and apprehension that he was praying literally the capillaries in his forehead. A medical fact was so, he was full of so much anguish that they burst, and that was the bleeding of the droplets of blood. Father, if this cup may pass from me. Nevertheless, biblical decision of love, biblical decision. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. Biblical love is a choice that you and I make. Love is the mark of a true disciple. We've all been around so much for so long that people will say, well, this is a mark of godliness, and this is a mark of godliness, and this is a mark of godliness. And as a young man, I was watching all this and hearing all this, and this is a mark, and this is a mark, and this is a mark, and it always dealt with some kind of exterior thing. And I'm sitting there going, I really, whoa, that was weird. <laughs> yes, Lord. I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm like, okay, 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 um... Wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the Bible for myself, and I'm studying for myself, and I realize that I'm not as smart as you, and I want to respect that and honor that, but as I'm reading for myself through the Word of God, there was a theme, as a, as a young man, I could not get away from, and that was the love of God in Christ Jesus, and love that was to fill our heart and life, and all of a sudden, I'm looking, and I'm like, wait a minute, it seemed like the most hateful, the meanest, the vulgar, ugly from behind the pulpit, those were the best preachers, and I'm sitting there going, yes, we need to preach the truth, and I came across one day, where the Word of God says, speaking the truth in. And I'm like, God, where is the love? Does it mean we compromise it? Does it mean we step away from truth? Love is a definition that we have entered into God's truth, and truth has entered into us. Oh, my soul, the priority of love. Let me skip some things. Number two, there's just three things. We're almost there. The priority of love, the purpose of love. He says in verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense until the day of Christ. Approve is to examine, to prove, to allow, to test. Uh, it was testing metals for their purity. Study and investigate, determine the best possible ways to obey and please the Lord and then to live accordingly that we may approve those things that are excellent. The best, most crucial, most important things that really count. What, what is our life about as we trek through life no matter how many days God may give us? What are those things that are worthy of our life, that are worthy of our thoughts, that are worthy of all that we have? What is it that's worthy within my life and yours? He says, I want you to approve and test and investigate and look in for yourself those things that are of utmost priority. Being able to discern good and evil is good, but there's something that's even beyond that. And live a life to the highest level of obedience and commitment to Jesus Christ, separating the mature from the immature, separating the weak from the strong in the faith. He says, I want you to take time and delve into and study and investigate with a heart that is full of love. What is it that really, really matters? What is worthy of our lives? Commitment to Jesus Christ. Commitment to the things of God. That you may, Tony, be sincere. Sincere. This has just a beautiful, beautiful background to its meaning. Testing by way of sunlight. Sunlight is a tremendous test. You heard of color fastness. And with color fastness, if the color is truly locked in, then even sunlight will not be able to fade and take out that color. Uh, you have different fibers. We look at the carpet, and there was a time that the carpet uh, had a coating on it, but the thread was there. There was a coating on it. And so once that coating on the outside was gone, the color was gone from the carpet. And then they created a fiber where the color was not like a, a what's that, it was dum, 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 drummy, what's that chocolate, that white, cho white ice cream, nice cone that's crunchy, and you dip it in chocolate. I don't know. What is it called? Dum Dums? Is that? Nutty Buddy? That's not ice cream. All right. Whatever. It is. You, want to, you follow one going. Let's go, to, let's go to Dairy Queen. Let's get the swirls of, 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 of vanilla ice cream, and they dip it in the hot fudge, and the hot fudge is on the outside, but the vanilla is still on the inside. 
He's like, we need to test by sunlight to get through and to see, is there love fastness, color fastness all through your life? Because one is like the hot fudge Sunday at, uh, at Dairy Queen, where there's a coating around it. The other one would be like a fudge sickle, where no matter where you cut into it, is it is the same all the way through. He's like, oh, I want love to fill your hearts and lives. And I want it to be of, of such a caliber that it is, it is sincere, you have approved it, you have tested it. It has gone against the test of time and trial. And you are seen full of love, cut all the way through that you may be sincere. There was an, an action by those that sold pottery during biblical days. And if pottery had a crack in it, they learned to take hot wax. And that hot wax they would put over the crack. And over the crack they would then reglaze and they would repaint trying to cover the, cla- the, the crack. The bad thing about it was when you would take that vessel, that piece of pottery, and you would hold it up to the sun and start rotating it, wherever that crack was, wherever that wax was, it would be darker in the sunlight than the other parts of the vessel. And they literally, when they were selling this pottery, they would have on that vessel or a sign on that table in in their language. And what it meant was, it meant without wax. And what they were saying was this, is that the vessel that you are buying, it is not cracked, it has not been deformed, it has not been broken, it is whole, it is the real thing. Now, wondering how many believers' lives could we wear a sign that says, for all those around when it comes to our love without wax. We're looking for truth. We're looking for real, without offense, not making other people stumble, not stumbling ourselves, not falling. We are full of abounding in the love of God. He says the priority of your love, the the purpose of your love, that it would have such an effect on other people, then the last thing is the pleasure of your love being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of God. He says that our lives would be so full of God and that God would overflow in love from our lives that He would get great glory based on our love into the lives of other people. Colossians 1, 5 and 6, he says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before the word of truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is into all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. There's a fruit that comes from us being under the word of God, in the word of God, submitted to the word of God, and allowing God's word to work and move within our life. We have Romans 1.13, this fruits of righteousness within our hearts and lives, loving people and loving souls. Watch what it says. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, I was hindered. He says that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Oh, the fruit that comes out of our life. The fruit that we manifest as God's Holy Spirit takes over and we allow Him to work and to love through us. Do you realize this, dear friends? That you and I, when we are in Christ Jesus and we're allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work and move in our heart and life, that we have a supernatural enabling of God to do what normally we would not be able to do. And you look and you say, preacher, they are so hard to love. Yes, they are. And you may be the they for somebody else. Amen or no? They are so hard to love. Yes. Would you get away from your feelings this morning? Would you get away from challenges, distractions this morning? And would you ask God's Holy Spirit to help you to love? I've heard testimony of of, of folks that have progressed through life. I think of a preacher down in South Georgia. And he was looking at me, and it was in an extreme moment of honesty. And this man had been preaching for years and years. He was quite well known. Been preaching for years and years and years and years. And I looked at him one day, and, and again, you got to remember, I was like 27, 28 when I first started pastoring after I'd been into the youth ministry. And I looked at him, and I said, I know that I'm a young man. And I said, I really know that I don't know anything. I was like, I realize my ignorance. I said, you have been in the ministry literally longer than I've been alive. You pastored one church longer than I've lived life. I was like, could I humbly ask you a question? And he looked back at me and said, sure. I said, if you had it to do all over again, 
and you were my age, what is one thing that you would change? Again, this man was well known, traveled extensively, planted several churches. He was in his 80s. I can see his face right now. I can see the glasses, his white hair. I can see this man in my, I can see him right now. With tears welling up within his eyes, he said this. I wouldn't be so mean. And I would learn to love before it's too late. God had already been working in my heart and life. I thought the meaner, harder, I thought that the veins in my neck were protruding and fire was coming out of my eyes. I want to be passionate when I preach. But I thought, boy, you got to shove the corn, amen. And I looked at a man that had traveled the road much further than even I've traveled today. I wouldn't be so mean, and I would learn to love sooner. Paul looks at a group of people, and he says, There's something that I want you to know I am praying for because it is of utmost importance. You have a life that is a vessel. And I am praying and asking God's Holy Spirit to be in you and you allow Him to have control of your life in such a way that you not only have enough for your vessel, your cup, but that your cup would be so full, Tony, that it would overflow into the lives of everybody that you come in contact with. We all know that one person, that whenever you come in contact with them, It doesn't matter your state of mind, your emotion, your day. It doesn't matter what's going on. When you enter their presence and when you leave their presence, there's a peaceful smile and joy and comfort in your life. Why? Because they allowed their love to overflow into your life. Are you that kind of person? Am I that kind of person? And Paul said to Philippi, I want you to be that kind of believer. Would you pray with me, Father? We love you. Thank you so much for God's people. Thank you, Lord, for the love that's in this church. Thank you for the love of each individual. I'm just staggered uh, with Newton Baptist Church. And I pray, God, that you would help us to grow and to abound and to overflow when it comes to the area of love. And there may be some this morning, their, their cups are quite empty. They, well, they've exhausted what they had and they've not, Lord, they've not had, so to speak, a fill up. And this morning, I pray that you would renew them. I pray that you would fill them up and that you would pour them out. I pray that our life would have an impact on the lives of others. I pray, Father, for a graciousness. I pray, Father, for a sweetness. I pray, Father, for a kindness. Sometimes in our flesh, it is truly challenging. And that's the reason, Father, you told us that we don't walk after the flesh. We're to walk in the Spirit. God, help me. Strengthen me. Help me to set the example. Help those listening by way of live stream today. Those sitting within our services. That, Father, the one thing, and it's not a matter that it's a philosophy of our ministry. But, Father, it would be a reality within our lives. The things that identify each and every one of us is love. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe you would just take a moment. Who is it that needs you to love them? Even as I say that, there's a grating within your soul. There's a grating within your soul. Would you pray for them right now? Would you pray God's blessings on them? Would you pray God help you to love them? It may be somebody you work with, maybe somebody you went to church with, maybe somebody in your neighborhood, maybe somebody in your family. They need you to love them. Preacher, this is not going to be easy. No, but with the Holy Spirit, it is possible. I believe is looking through the congregation that you all have given testimony of your salvation through Jesus Christ. May that love that he showed you be shown to other people as you abound in love. Father, bless as we depart. May the love of Christ be shed abroad in our heart and pour out on other people today. For we ask all this in Jesus' Jesus' sweet name. Amen and amen.